Citrix is probably best known for virtualization software. Many people do know that we have networking products, but they don't know the breadth of the networking products. So Netscaler has an ADC component. It also <coughs> has a VPN component. And the big part of how we think about our product is around elasticity. So we put a big focus around that and what we can do for that. On the ADC piece, this is what you would expect out of any ADC. So this has the full load balancing stack, SSL, app firewall, uh, performance characteristics, etc. You can think of what a load balancer would do in this modern world, and it does that. So it is definitely a lot more than HA proxy, uh, and it's on par with all of our other comp competitors out there in the landscape as far as ADC goes. What that has done for us, especially given our focus around performance, is that it has landed us in a lot of clouds and a lot of enterprises. So amongst the clouds, sites like AWS, uh, SoftLayer, Azure, they're all using Netscaler, not just as an over-the-top service that you can get from the marketplace, but actually as an underpinning that supports the infrastructure itself. We also have a very strong presence in the enterprise where we've been able to go and leverage our performance characteristics for being able to get in there and displace a lot of our competitors who come in and you know they've gotten very complex and I think that that performance penalty is something that no one ever wants to pay. On the VPN side of the house, we're not just an SSL VPN. If we're honest with ourselves, SSL VPN hasn't materially changed in about a decade. What's really new is that there's a big consolidation phase that's happening around VPNs, where we're not just looking at VPNs in isolation, but we're also looking at what we can do for web applications and bringing in the reverse proxy with authentication and security elements to that. We're also looking at how identity, especially for SaaS applications, fall into that. We're looking at how we can go and apply this to virtual desktops because more and more enterprises are adopting virtual desktops as a way of being able to drive mobility and bring and centralize and secure classic applications. And finally, there's the mobility, true mobility end of it, and that is how do you provide XML security for something that's primarily API driven. That's actually becoming a part of the VPN story as well. When you go and you pull all those together, this is not just a classic VPN anymore, but this is really about all app access. So from a training perspective for end users, how do you go and tell somebody who may have had a dozen different ways to access, you know, dozens of different applications, you can now go to one place and access all apps from there, and that's what we're doing with our VPN. On the Triscale piece, we really take elasticity to heart. It's very important to us and it's part of our core design. And we've taken this all the way to not just mean software, but we've also taken it to mean hardware as well. We've brought elasticity in our hardware so that you can go and say, start with a 15 gig box and with a software license, pop it up to 42 gigs and not pay a penalty for having to do that. This has been something that has allowed somebody to buy for today and not worry about the three year later problem. We also go and do a lot of work around bringing elasticity into multi-tenancy. That is, how do you go and drive a large number of instances into a small box? The reason why this is special and not just, say, a virtual instance running on a hypervisor is that we've managed to retain all of the performance characteristics that the iron does in this kind of configuration at a density level that has not been achieved on traditional hypervisors with traditional VMs. Lastly, we've got a scale out model. So if you want to be able to go and horizontally scale the devices, you can build together a cluster and we have a peak performance of up to 5.1 terabits per second at layer seven. So this is you know, by far the fastest way to get layer seven all on one IP that you can get today. This is something that's unique to Netscaler and right now we're very proud of that design. So to wrap things up, key features, well, clicked a little too fast, key features, a lot of layer seven intelligence policies, security, SDN, cloud integration. How do you go and tie into things like ACI? How do you tie into NSX? How do you tie into OpenStack, et cetera? And of course, driving visibility. If I can go and get all of this data through it, if I have visibility into the transaction, how do I go pop that out the side and see more into that? Beno will talk more about that visibility dimension a little bit later. We also have all of the major form factors available. We've got a uh, virtual appliance, hardware appliance, as well as a multi-tenant appliance. You can get those all today. We have a container and tech preview. So if you have uh, an interest in the tech preview, let us know. We'll definitely work with you and see uh, how we can engage on that. And then finally, for those of you who do know us from a more traditional virtualization sense, we have unique integrations with our other products as well. Uh, this is something where you know anybody who's looking at an MDM, MAM solution, or virtual desktop, virtual app solution, the, the linchpin that holds it all together is Netscaler. 
So with that, I'm going to turn it over to a smart person. Actually, before we turn it over to the next smart person, any <coughs> questions about what it is we do in the scope of products? Okay. I promised I'd keep it short because I knew that would not be the most interesting part. Let's find smart people to talk. I get to speak to the rated R version. You can get into all sorts of gory details. I'd like to keep this session interactive. So if you have any questions, please feel free to stop and ask questions. So uh, in this section, I will uh, cover the architecture of uh, Netscaler. And one thing you will realize is that there's a common thread as I go through this architecture is about performance. Um, it will also give you a glimpse into history of the product, how we evolved from single packet engine to multi-core to uh, multi-node to VPX to CPX, and all of the and you'll get a view of some of the decisions made along the way, and they're all kind of threaded and centered around performance. So, uh, so as uh, Steve and Abhishek uh, mentioned. So our focus has always been to be software first. Uh, you know, it's, it's a stand that we took about 18 uh, years ago, and today the industry has come around uh, to, you know, with renewed focus on software, on converged infrastructure. And so, so we feel quite happy with the decision that was made 18 years ago to bet, uh, bet on x86 architecture and really look at places where we could offload some of the compute-bound jobs, uh, like crypto or a few stuff that can be done on Nick, and I'll get into that shortly. So what we did realize, though, uh, while general purpose hardware works very well uh, for, for our functionality like what we try to do, general purpose operating systems do not. Uh, we started with the free BSD as a base operating system, uh, but we soon realized that BSD is, you know, any other OS, it, has, uh, it needs to support uh, several different applications. It needs to be fair in terms of scheduling. However, our function was to be central in the network, uh, be purposeful to uh, push packets. Uh, and, and so we felt that, you know, so we started with BSD, but then we soon realized that that's not the OS for us. So we ripped apart the networking subsystem of BSD, the layer two subsystem of BSD, and replaced with our own highly uh, efficient uh, purpose built for packet pushing uh, TCP IP stack and zero copy uh, uh, driver stack. Uh, and, and with that, we got uh, good sort of performance. But then as we started looking deeper into it, then we said, hey, you know what? We are on x86. Why don't we just look deeper into x86 instruction set? Let's see how CPU works and do some fine tuning to it to get the kind of performance we get. And as uh, Abhishek mentioned earlier, cycles for cycles, we are the best in the industry right now in terms of what we can uh, squeeze out of Intel CPU. So, so let me give you a little bit of example. So as we started polling the NIC, you know, so polling versus interrupt is another thing. Uh, we, we soon realized that when you, when you operate in interrupt driven mode, there's too much context switches that happens. So we went to polling mode, you know, just like some of the other appliances as well. Uh, however, when we start, went into polling mode and as we started looking deeper into the packets and we started polling packets from the NIC, we realized that you know, CPU is much faster than slower DRAMs. So many a times we found that CPU is actually waiting for to fetch memory from the uh, for fetch data from the main memory. So they, they will be explaining a lot of memory stalls. We started observing a lot of uh, making uh, paying close attention to Intel counters uh, for uh, write stalls and read stalls. And that's where uh, we started doing things like prefetching of uh, data so that by the time you're done processing with the current packet, next packet is already warm in our uh, CPU cache. And uh, one of the things that we observed was any time you fetch data from, say, L3 cache, for instance, right, uh, versus get data from main memory, you will find that getting data from L3 cache is about twice as fast and actually just progressively becomes worse at higher data rates than getting it from uh, main memory. So, so these are some of the learnings we, did, we observed and we kind of built on it. Uh, and uh, along the way, we felt that, you know, some things like crypto can be very easily offloaded to a, a off-the-shelf uh, crypto uh, card. And so we went to vendors that provide uh, uh, off-the-shelf uh, solution for uh, crypto. Uh, to get into a little bit of details, so, so the net of it is we had to come up with a real-time system. And building a real-time system is not easy, right? Because uh, uh, there are many things to take into account. We, I, I mentioned about how we went into polling mode, right? So where, when you go into polling mode, you need to pay attention to many of the other things. Like, for instance, what happens when you're dealing with, like, millions of connections. When dealing with millions of connections, you cannot afford to lose CPU you know, for servicing this connection because you can, that could lead to packet discards. For instance, uh, on a 10 gig Ethernet, you have about 50 million packets per second, so which means you, have, you really have uh, you know, maybe just a, a few microseconds at worst case, and many times you're going to do even sooner faster than that. 
to process all the packets otherwise you can lead to packet discards so how do you manage timers how you how do you slice the uh, cpu time across various functions we have in the netscaler so we have to pay close attention to each of those things um, uh, how do you uh, uh, manage uh, uh, in access to the box when the box is running out of memory or box is running at hyper high CPU because the last thing you want to do is when the box is 100% CPU you want access into the box to find out what's going on so, so we have carefully set aside uh, resources to uh, add this to those uh, needs right um, uh, uh, the other thing is how do you do memory allocations and pool management uh, different features have different requirements on memory, but that doesn't mean that we give the entire memory set to those features. So, so we have uh, slab allocation so that uh, uh, we take good advantages of uh, TLBs as well, and also do uh, could uh, pool management so that we don't allow any one feature to take away all the memory. Uh, so one <coughs> thing that we realized early on is going to BSD for memory management is just not going to scale, not going to scale for our requirements. So that's why we built our own uh, memory manager as well. Uh, the other thing to note is the place where we sit in the network, we have visibility into lots of data, right? And uh, one of the important uh, value we bring to our customers is uh, how to give visibility into this data. So we, Netscale collects about 10,000 plus counters. And you can, at any, any point in time, you can check into Netscale and it, we will give you about these 10,000 counters on a per second basis. Uh, so to collect these counters, is itself is a, uh, there's a lot of technical challenges are there in this so we had to build a really sophisticated system that allowed us to really collect this count 10000 plus counters also on a transa per transaction counters and make it available for for our customers uh, and this actually is one of our strengths because anytime uh, uh, um, we get an escalation from customers we are very quickly able to zero in on uh, the, the root cause uh, and uh, we are, the fact that we are able to share this kind of data with our customers even our customers love it so so in many ways this is also one of the reasons uh, but there's clearly one angle where you sell the product because of the feature it uh, supports this is uh, some of these things really helps in uh, significantly reducing uh, troubleshooting time for our customers so, so not something to be taken lightly. And here in this chart, I'm, I'm just showing you, uh, um, we, we did a test. This was at a customer site and done by a third party. Um, in, in this, this test clearly shows as you increase the number of concurrent connections, and in this case, the lower is better, and the green one is Netscaler. Uh, at 1 .2, even at 1.2 million, million concurrent connections, our latency was pretty much steady for the reasons I mentioned, because we do good time slicing of CPU so that it doesn't affect the data path functions, for the reasons we allocate enough resources so that you don't lose manageability, uh, for the reasons you, you kind of carefully uh, manage your timers. Uh, whereas uh, with the competition, you can see uh, as the concurrent connections went up, the latency suffered. I would like to uh, take a pause here. Any of you have any questions? So far? Yes, that wasn't enough information. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the roots of the product. So many years ago, it was a river head. Was that the original? Oh, uh, different company. Different company. Yeah. Okay. Getting confused then. It's easily done for me. Um, but you know, this is where the, the operating system. This is the difference between a Linux with some kernel modules and a custom operating system that's at layer seven it has a completely different way of processing. So yeah. your criticism of hard proxy is valid, right? But there are times when hard proxy can work, but this is the thing that you need when you need to go beyond that. That's, that's sort of the summary takeaway that I would take. That's right, and especially the place that we, where we sit in the network, we kind of load balance and uh, offload about thousands of servers, right? So we cannot afford to be the choke point. Yes. Right, so. <clears throat> uh, I have one uh, question. To ma <coughs> how many sessions do you have uh, tested it? This, this shows one Oh yeah, that, that's a very good question. So our box can support upwards of 50 to 50 plus million concurrent connections. I think, oh. believe it's close to 70 plus million concurrent connections. And uh, I'll get into the architecture. The architecture scales quite linearly with number of packet engines. And at each of those, and even at this high numbers, because of the way the system is architected, it, you'll not suffer in terms of uh, packet drops because we kind of time slice important functions. So, so you will pretty much see the same thing. Even at 100% CPU, even at 50 plus million concurrent connection, you will see the same graph. 50 million concurrent connection, I'm impressed. Yeah. Yes. And, I mean, not everyone needs 50 million concurrent connections, obviously, right? Um, but the way that translates to, say, more of a traditional enterprise that may be seeing thousands or tens of thousands of concurrent, concurrent connections, you're going to see this form as lower latency with richer policies, which tends to be typically the case. So, you know, you get the trade-off. 
Uh, most times you think you don't need it and then something happens and that is good sure. if your hardware is capable of that, yeah. And we like it when something happens because that means you're buying more boxes. So <laughs> that's always a good thing. So uh, our, our attention to detail in terms of how we squeeze the maximum out of Intel CPU is not just related, uh, limited to the lower layer subsystem. Uh, we pay the same amount of care and due diligence and scrutiny to uh, layer 7 protocols as well. So uh, uh, case in point being uh, our policies. Uh, uh, our policies were now, compared to some of uh, the other vendors, uh, our, our policy is a declarative way of uh, expressing what user wants to do. Now, the good thing about that is because it's a declarative way, it's all compiled in. The code is actually stored inside the, you know, in, in the machine language, in the language that CPU natively understands, versus in case of interpreted languages where the lot of interpretation gets done at runtime. Right, so right there, we have huge performance uh, improvement for, for our policies. Uh, and let, let me give you an example with the, and why this is also beneficial. Uh, uh, if you take an example, which is fairly common, uh, which is uh, uh, if you want to take a, a set of strings and if you want to uh, do pattern matching across a sequence of packets. Right? So with Netscaler policy engine, we will internally, we, we take those inputs. So we essentially take, uh, ask user what you want to do and we absorb that input and we will internally uh, up, uh, run some sophisticated algorithms against it and do pattern matching in parallel across uh, a sequence of packet as opposed to allowing the users to define how to do it by writing scripts. So, so we don't let users uh, uh, you know, write their own sophisticated bloom filters or woman bar uh, search algorithms. Instead, we just take the input and we implement those algorithms uh, internally in the code. Now, the one other advantage of that is uh, we, we, we stay current with the industry. So as, as there are more new research uh, uh, done on pattern matching and other optimizations, we, we change, we optimize the code. So all user has to do, they upgrade the code and they get this benefit, as opposed to if you leave this all to user, then you, they don't get the benefit because you're essentially asking users to write those algorithms in, this, in the scripts. So that's another example why uh, doing some, paying close scrutiny to how the packet engine operates and coding around it is, helps. And I'll show some details of the actual UI and some of that in a little bit. Okay, so uh, so, I, so till now I talked about how Packet Engine works, but Packet Engine is not a singular entity. We have multiple copies of Packet Engines that run on every core of the more modern processors to take advantage of the horsepower that we have. Now this is again, in, in terms of evolution, we started with single Packet Engine, uh, say a single process, Two, as the multi-cores became av available, we moved to multi-core. Now, now, the thing is, when, when we when we start looking at this problem, when we had uh, so much uh, computer at our disposal, uh, we said, hey, you know, let's let's take this problem of scale, and how how do we solve this problem? And one thing we said was right uh, right right at the get-go is that to really truly get a lot of scales, you have to minimize coordination between packet engines. Now, don't do any any data sharing. Don't get any locking because that's going to kill the performance, right? Other thing is we said you need to minimize serialization and sequential access to the code. Uh, like for instance, uh, and when I say sequ sequential access, not in terms of uh, in uh, not only in terms of code execution, but also in terms of the atomic uh, data unit that you process. For instance, uh, where, where, uh, the place where we sit in the network, we pre we process lots of connections. Now. Dividing the workload by individual connections is a, uh, is a good subset where you can very easily parallelize across packet engines. Now you cannot take, within a flow, you cannot take packets and spray because that will actually kill performance. But uh, taking the number of connections that comes into the box and just parallelizing across cores is a very good uh, atomic unit that you can do. So there, where we looked at, uh, we had a choice of building our own ASIC or uh, go and look at uh, what's available in the industry. And there, uh, most of the modern NICs support RSS. And at RSS, you can very easily distribute flows across packet engine. So, so this is again an example where, where we are where at the crossroads of building our own ASIC versus truly depending on software. And uh, we, we went with the software path. And actually, it's just paid off a big dividends for us. So, uh, and then the third piece is, uh, you know, how do you balance the load to get scale? And I just talked about how we, the decision to go with RSS uh, and making sure that uh, there's affinity for of a flow to a single of, to one packet engine. And that in, in, in so so basically, just following this very three basic simple principle, we were able to scale packet engines almost linearly. Yep, and that's a key point, right? Because if you look at the concurrent connections number. You basically, if one packet engine is supporting 5 million concurrent connections, just look at the number of cores on any given Netscaler box, up to 15 available on the high end. You can just do simple math. 15 times 5, 75 million concurrent connections. Hmm. There you go. No overhead 
because of this architecture where you get the drop-off, which is typical in other architectures. This would also keep the processing or the performance linear as you do application munging. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Which I think is even more important because the, the, the layer three, layer four features are moving into the SDN layer. And really, as you've already intimated this morning, you're moving your value proposition into the layer seven. Yep. So your ability to transform the data stream in your code is the performance is the key performance factor. Exactly. It's not I mean, about packets or bits or flows these days. It's because previously, the layer seven. right? You know, we had one core. We were limited to just that one core for processing. If you wanted to do layer seven, if you wanted to do compression, web app firewall, you'd be robbing Peter to pay Paul. Yeah. Now you've got tons of extra CPU for all that extra functionality, which delivers value to the customer. And the other thing that I learned the hard way about these high flow counts is in DDoS attacks. So DDoS isn't a security problem, it's a reliability issue or a stabi site stability issue. A lot of people think that DDoS is about security. It's not about security, it's about reliability and stability. And having very high, like ridiculously high flow counts actually is in your favor. You want to have just so much that you never have to worry whether your device can cope with millions of flows because it doesn't take much to write a Perl script or Madidi, or a Python script, or JavaScript, that the, can just <laughs> create a lot of flows on your side. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's so true, because see, when we started out, so this is this architecture and mindset has been right from day one. Mm -hmm. And when Netscaler started out, there were a lot of other vendors as well in the, in the ADC space. But where we actually got a lot of traction is as a DDoS uh, protector. Yeah. So we got pulled into a lot of SYN attack uh, deployments, so a lot of DNS flood attack deployments. So to give you some numbers, uh, on our latest platform, we can do about 35 million SYN, SYN packets per second, SYN attacks per second. Yeah. We can do about 35 million uh, for small queries, uh, DNS requests per second. So it's precisely for these kind of flood attacks and DDoS scenarios we got pulled in, and that's when that's how we started getting a lot of traction in the market, and, and then we added a lot of ADC functionality, and that's how we grew. And, yeah. and specifically, it's the architecture too, because we designed it from the ground up as a TCP proxy yep. by the nature of the TCP proxy. In fact, I remember in our first deployments, we didn't even really know about the fact that we were really effective DDoS protection because the mechanism we used was using the SYN cookie and not having connection tables. Yep. So we were actually getting, I had a customer of mine, an ISP down here at Earthlink. They called me up and they said, um, well, good news, bad news. Good news is, um, you know, our net scales are up. Bad news, we're getting a 500 meg SYN flood. We have it a one gig box at the time. And we didn't know about it. I'm like, that's not bad, right? Your site's still up. They're like, yeah, but we'd like you to tell us when it happens next time. Mm -hmm. So that's when we added counters for it. But that's because we're proxying the connections and the way we do it yep. by the nature of the design. You might want to explain SYN cookies. Not too many people know what a SYN cookie is. Oh, so um, the, no the thing with SYN attacks, real quick, normally if you have a SYN attack, you basically got incoming SYNs and you maintain a connection table on your device, which takes up memory. Instead, there's something in the TCP options field where you can actually store information and send it back. So when the first SYN comes, when you send the SYN act back, we actually hash on unique characteristics of the incoming connection, you know, source IP port and sequence number, etc. store that information in the SYN cookie field. So if it's a valid client, when they return the connection back, we know, oh, there's a SYN cookie, okay, let's allocate a back-end connection and resources of the Netscaler. If not, then we just don't worry about it. Other devices don't do that. They have a connection table which is easily overwhelmed in an attack, so we're able to scale with just a small CPU hit, again, by design being a TCP proxy, which was unique in the industry and still continues to this day. SYN cookies are cool. Yep, exactly. You only allocate the, the flow in the table once you... The the third what the third handshake actually actually for that's for TCP for HTTP we don't even allocate anything in the, in, until we get the actual HTTP request right you guys are going to do my entire session yeah well that's <laughs> right. true oh yeah we are talking about that stuff sorry go, go. <laughs> so, so I just want to add one more comment uh, so everything that you saw here we, perf we, we are always layer 7 switched on. Yep. Compared to some of the other vendors that have layer 4 and layer 4 7 mode, we are always layer 7 switched on. So all our numbers that I'm going to be sharing, all the design that we are, I'm talking about, it's with layer 7 processing. Because for us, okay, right? So because a lot of the other a lot of the other products in this space, they do one set of performance at layer three, yeah, thirty percent less at layer yes, four, correct. and seventy percent less at layer seven, and you've got no idea what the actual performance of the box is. Correct. So you tell me a number, you're almost committing to me that that number is what's really going to happen. That's well, and again, to be clear, not only are we doing that now with multi-core, it will happen. Yeah. Back in the past, if we said we did a million HB requests per second, well, if you turn on other features, you'd only have one's core, you'd have to, you know, drop that. Yeah. Now, you're going to get that number and you'll have CPU to spare mm -hmm. and it will be operating natively at layer 7. And uh, I suggest if a new x86 processor comes out, a new generation with more cores, 
for you, it is not that big if a effort to port your system to the next generation. Done that multiple times. Multiple times, and you are way ahead of your competitors. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you don't have to spin up new ASICs. Okay. Exactly. Th that's good. And the software-oriented approaches exactly gives us that. Right? I mean, as Intel advances the state of the art in technology with more core count or uh, higher clock speed or higher cache size, we just directly get benefit of that. We're on our fifth <coughs> generation of that as we speak already. Okay. Yep. So the old school thought is obviously that hardware is better than software. Sorry? Are, oh, the hardware, old. Yeah, the old yeah. school thought. So how are you guys penetrating? Yeah. yeah. How are you reaching out to customers and trying to convince them that software is not always, you know, you know, uh, that, that software can beat out hardware, right? I think it's it's always proof is in the pudding. Yep. Right. And I think that was it was a really challenging thing. Maybe I'd say a couple of years ago uh, or, or and before, where you know somebody would say, "But I've got you know this has an ASIC. How do you beat the ASIC?" And you'd be put on the defensive, and it'd become a you know proofs in the pudding. Uh, and you know we're now a six hundred mil something million dollar line of business. We're the twelfth largest networking company in the world. So. That, that approach of proof is in the pudding has worked for us. We're now blessed at the, to be at the point where everyone is on board with the software is the right way to do networking. And so with that, we're actually getting pulled into the conversation. Uh, and I think it's going to be interesting because I think this year moving forward, it's going to be hardware's on the defensive. Mm -hmm. You can't call yourself a software company and then roll out a bunch of new hardware platforms and say, look at the new ASIC in it. I, I, that's just backward. So do you think it's validation, the fact that the whole SD-WAN or SD software-defined, and you guys have been doing software for how many years now? Netscaler's been out. 18 um, years. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> He's the I smart one who figured it out, so <laughs> we'll, we'll give him the credit. But yeah. yeah. No, exactly. Uh, it is. I mean, the way to think about it is that... Mike. No, oh. Hey, I held Mike. Well, there we go. I mean, the one way to think about it is... Turn it on. Uh, sorry. Here we go, yes. <laughs> so just to sort of extend on that... Um, Customers want the flexibility of consuming functionality in a software way. And in some cases, they'll want the acceleration and sort of the other pieces that the hardware gives you. So what we've done here is combine the best of giving you the agility on software. So going back to Abhishek's point, it's the consume it any way you want. If the speed and sort of, uh, you know, consolidation of capacity you want is form factored for hardware, then you can buy it as hardware. But... The fact that it's a commodity hardware as opposed to custom-built ASICs or things like that help us ride the cost curve, help us ride the performance curve in a better way than the competition. And sort of the classic phrase right now is, you know, software is eating the world. The customers do want that five-year sort of time horizon where they're looking at porting applications to the cloud. They're moving it, you know, between different sort of uh, form factors. If we don't give them that sort of software modality, they don't get the flexibility. And that's, I think, where the world is, you know, fortunately over an 18-year period, the, the advantage is moving towards software and not towards hardware. And that's obviously working in our favor. Yeah. And I, and I will say, you know, I've been with the company now 15 years. And for the longest time, I was like, we sell hardware boxes. Right, but then we introduced the virtual appliance. We went multi-core. We basically really separated out at that point, and I realized that yeah, it's the hardware doesn't matter. It's about the code. It's about what Anil and the engineering team and these guys have written, and it's very extensible and can be deployed in multiple form factors. And now we've got the CPX and containerization coming out, and just like Steve said, the proof is in the pudding, right? Because customers see the flexibility that you have when you separate the software from the underlying hardware. And that's what they actually really want, and they're getting that. Let's skip through. All right. So, 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 how, so this is you know again just a quick re recap how the how the architecture looks inside the box, right? So you have multiple packaging, is one on each core. Each packaging gets its own uh, uh, virtual address uh, space, uh, and then very very little little sharing. Uh, but but having said that, there still needs to be some li li little little bit of coordination that needs to happen between cores. And for that, we have a communication subsystem that's built off of shared memory, uh, where these packaging is talk to each other. But but again, the key key point here is very little coordination, and that's that's what really uh, gets you the scale. And what you get with that, uh, we talked about uh, the architecture, but this is truly what you get. Um, 160 GBPS with the latest platform, 4.6 million HTTP requests per second on a 15 packet engine system, 
um, really, really high numbers. And uh, uh, to, to the point that was uh, just recently made, uh, we not only do, do, do this number scale linearly as you add more packet engine, but when you add more nodes and with clustering, and I'll get into clustering a little bit, uh, you get linear scale there, there as well. Uh, so we have demonstrated in, in our labs up to five terabits per second uh, through a 32 node cluster. Okay, so, so moving on. Not that much traffic, really. <laughs> so, so moving on, uh, so I talked about how we see, uh, went from one packet engine to multi-packet engine and how the share, shared nothing architecture helped us scale linearly. Now, if you think about it, uh, because of that one fundamental decision that we made, which is share nothing, uh, uh, go with minimal coordination, is the one. Now, it doesn't matter where the packet engine is running. If it's running on one box or across multiple boxes, it's the same technology. The only thing we had to do was change the uh, underlying subsystem from shared memory to now work over Ethernet. And, and we, we got similar amount of scale and the architecture just lends itself nicely uh, for, for clustering as well. And uh, that, that's what you get with clustering, where you can scale up to uh, 32 nodes, and uh, we can get up to 5 terabits per second. Yeah, I remember hearing about clustering when they first talked about it, and it was pretty cool. Basically, it was just taking what happens within the NetScaler box and extending it out to layer 3. And they leverage the exact same underlying architecture, and just, yeah, do a few things here, and then boom, we got clustering. And, and nothing in here is tied to the system, not tied to hardware. So you could just take the same technology, run it in some other form factor, and it pretty much gets a similar amount of linear scale. <clears throat> All right, so, so this is uh, just an eye candy chart, uh, just to kind of stress the point that because we bet on software, it really allowed us to be very nimble and agile, and we were able to come up with new set of features every year and I've, I've just listed all the big rocks in here uh, like the data stream or uh, uh, VPN, gateway, clustering technology, uh, admin partitions, uh, CPX, these are all uh, really big, big ticket items that and because we bet us, uh, our, the philosophy has been go with software first in, in our mind. So, so this really tells you that, right? So, um, and uh, the same software first architecture has allowed us to uh, no move from one form factor to another because again very less dependency on uh, the hardware as intel comes up with new chips we automatically benefit from from the uh, uh, the techno uh, technical advance uh, advancement of the technology and uh, we, we with us the same code bits run on the different form factor be it vpx mpx sdx cpx uh, uh, and so so the, and also all the way to uh, uh, azure or aws so whatever tools you write on for MPX are naturally extend over to other form factors as well. Yeah, I just want to make sure I, I highlight that with customers, sometimes they're surprised. You have an MPX, you want to upgrade the code on version 10.5, build 56 to fi build 57. If you have a VPX virtual appliance, you download the exact same tarball to upgrade your VPX from build 56 to build 57. Same GUI, same CLI, same exact code base. Makes it great for dev, QA, and deploying stuff and moving it into production. That's right. So, that's it. Uh, done with my section. Any uh, questions? Everything was crystal clear. You got all that. <laughs> As I say, no, no questions. It's still all just sinking in. It's okay, a yeah. lot of yeah. information. It's a fantastic presentation. I really, really appreciate it. I think it. it's you now, Steve. Uh, Real yes. quick around performance. So the web is going encrypted, right? Everyone's going encrypted. A lot of the vendors are scrambling to kind of change their performance numbers because when you flip on SSL on a load balancer or an application, right? I mean, all of a sudden performance, again, to Greg's point, right? Performance, halves, you know, quarters. I mean, I, where do you guys see yourself? You see yourself as not, that's not, not going to be a bottleneck based on the architecture? That's well, the only ASICs we have on the NetScaler are obviously for SSL. And let's be clear, um, we are partnering with the people who make these ASICs, Cavium, Intel, whomever, um, and talking very greatly because, you know, there was the performance drop when you went from 1K to 2K. Yeah. And we're well aware of what's going to happen with 4K and things like ECDHE and PFS and all that stuff. So we're, we're well in talks with them and looking at, you know, what's going to happen with future stuff. But the point is, if you need SSL performance, we've got some of the best in the industry. We've got a lot of chips and we're well aware of what's coming there. Yeah, uh, the latest box can support over 330K. Uh, transactions per second. Yeah, I mean, actually, a lot SSL, of the, uh, the fact that more people are turning on SSL is actually great news for us. Yep, because <laughs> you need to buy more and bigger time. boxes. <laughs> I just had, a, just had a customer who did that. They were like, oh, we got to turn on SSL for 
a large streaming you know site and it's like wow you look at the performance numbers especially if you want to prepare for the next three to five years mm. it's it's significant it's an interesting question when you consider the cloud well how much stuff are people really going to be able to deploy in the cloud if security is a concern right so we're happy about that. Right, and remember that you know if you're running your application in a cloud, you, a, your you can't park a oh, hardware. You're, oh, you can't you can't park a hardware box in the cloud. It's a software only solution. So the fact that it's SSL and the fact that we're software is all goodness for us. Mm. So Anil, thank you very much. All right. Can thank you just you. talk real briefly about um, the container piece of this? I mean, I, I know you said it's in like. Tech uh, we field. got a section on that. Oh, perfect. That's cool. what he's here for. Yeah, I'll be covering that. In a okay, cool. So. Awesome. So we're 10 minutes behind, so I'm going to talk fast. <laughs> uh, the good news is that they have covered like my next slide, so I think we're in good shape. Uh, you know, this is obviously an eye chart. I'm not going to you know bore you through the details, uh, but uh, ha happy to to you know share more of this information with anyone. Actually, most of this should already be on our website. But basically, you can think of the NetSkater as actually being that layer two through seven security device. So. You know, we've got everything two and three down at the network security layer, especially on things like segmentation, being able to run multiple route domains in a single uh, device, uh, being able to go and drive multiple instances in a single hardware device, a lot of the DDoS stuff we already talked about. We also have the layer four and five stuff, so TCP proxies. There was a couple of attacks that were mentioned earlier, what happens when you get flooded, uh, how do you go and deal with somebody who's just... Um, opening up a bunch of connections but not sending any data, et cetera. A lot of those defenses are already in place. And ditto with SSL. Uh, there was a comment made earlier about performance being one of the values of how you do security. And there's something to be said about that. Uh, one of my favorite planes, I have a nine-year-old, so planes are obviously are in our daily vocabulary, <laughs> is the SR-71. And the security uh, system for the SR-71 is hit the gas. You just outrun your competitors. And sometimes that's what you just need to do in these attacks. Uh, and it's part of the reason why some of the biggest DDoS services in the world are now using NetScaler. On the layer seven side of things, we are a full app firewall. And I'm gonna slow down for just a moment on that. So this is all the things that you would expect out of a modern app firewall. Uh, it's not just the SQL injection, cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, blah, 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 OWASP top 10, which have been around for a while. But it's a lot of the stuff that makes the system able to learn your web infrastructure, uh, dynamically go and figure out what are the input parameters that are valid versus not valid. Uh, these are all things that we can do in the device that make it able to customize itself to your site without necessarily having you go and understand your own application inside out. Uh, this is commonly an issue with a lot of uh, security administrators who are being told, go secure an application, but by the way, none of the app developers want to talk to you. We hear that all the time. The fact that it can learn and tune itself becomes a huge factor it's, it's in what a, it can do. It's a positive security model, right, to be clear. You put it in learning mode, it learns what's going on with the application, then you can actually generalize it to regular expressions and then turn blocking on. Everything that falls outside the parameters of what you've learned at that point gets blocked. If traffic comes through, we alert you on it, and then if you actually see something interesting that should go through, you can relax the rules. But it's the exact opposite of your typical normal firewall negative security model where you have to blacklist first. So that inverse protection helps protect you against the zero day attacks. And that's necessary, right? So I've been in, if you're doing websites, you don't want to block everything and whitelist. No. Because right. you block a lot of stuff. Yeah. Like developers are off on their own tangent. You need to secure. You need to get visibility and then yep. block and t test and then block. Right. Data-driven uh, security. Yeah. 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 As opposed to the usual idiot security models that we have in the enterprise. Yeah. And, and you know, um, not everyone wants to go all in on that. They want to take baby steps in that direction. And so, if you do want to start with the blacklists, uh, you can go and grab the the latest snort descriptions, shove them in there, and I'll happily sign them. Snort, CD, bug track, we can download signatures, you can apply them, and we do have the built-in protections yeah, of for yeah. all the basic stuff, too. So that's a good way of starting, right? So if you're just new to this, and as somebody who went through this many years ago and started from zero and had to invent the rules, it's a lot easier to go and get the yes. predefined stuff that's in the open source communities as, part, as a starting point for your modeling of that, pro that configuration. There, exactly. There's there an advantage here for um, a lot of customers who don't <laughs> even know what the protocols are that are running. Exactly. Right? A lot of times in healthcare, they go, I have no idea what GE's application is doing, mm. GE Medical or yep. you know, Epic or whatever, and they try going back to those vendors and they get nothing back. Sure. Mm -hmm. mm. So they don't even know what the protocols are and, and what we And we, the we and see it all. Like that. Right. So the auto learning mechanism is very good for that. Well, and then, you know, going back to the simplicity, you know, you can 
divide things up as saying there's there's two halves of the world: those who want to get rich and and do the advanced stuff, but there's this whole emerging space of a ton of people that are just trying to wrap their heads around the simplest thing because mm -hmm. they've heard you know these scary people called anonymous keep wanting to break into websites and steal things and so they're still looking for the checkbox you know red green uh yellow status mm -hmm. and so the fact that you can start from there you have checkbox items for things like sql injection you know if we see that pattern just block it and then being able to grow up into the rest of it without having <coughs> to go and redo the whole infrastructure becomes a value as well mm -hmm. moving forward uh, there is a full AAA stack, so everything that you, you know, know and love about AAA and want in a AAA infrastructure are present. About a third of our customers actually run NetScaler in that use case. So it is extremely common for us. Security is, is something that a lot of our customers are doing with the NetScaler. Uh, that includes things like Kerberos, so if you want to use NetScaler as a gateway between, say, uh, SAML and classic Active Directory, you can do that. So your internal AD users can exist in a SAML landscape without having to expose AD to the scary world. Uh, and then you can't secure what you can't see. So a lot of that visibility piece factors into that. And again, Benno will get into that in more detail. Real quick, just to be clear, he's talking about in a you know traffic management scenario, you can actually have the NetScale or add authentication for your web apps, not just in the remote access VPN scenario where obviously you, you need to support that. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to give uh, five details around this, uh, but since we're running out of time and we already covered a few of these, I'm gonna gloss over them. Uh, one of the big things about any device that's providing security is how do you manage memory pressure because that's actually one of the biggest threats on a device like this. Uh, an attack vector that you know, used to be a far more common was you'd open up a bunch of connections and then start sending fragments, right? And then you're waiting for TCP reassembly to happen, TCP reassembly doesn't happen, and then you just run out of memory and the box you know, crashes. Uh, you know, we've seen devices where the system configuration, it's actually in the GUI, it'll say, oh, if I'm at 85% memory utilization, assume something bad has happened and reboot. Uh, and you get a reboot storm between a pair of boxes. So we're very aggressive about managing memory and making sure that we don't let memory turn us into something bad. And you do that two ways. Number one, you take advantage of the fact that a lot of the underlying protocols do allow you to do things like flush unrecognized data. So in a TCP packet that has not been fully reassembled yet, you can, oh. Uh, Are you getting a little excited there? <laughs> yeah. When he talks about TCP, he gets lost sometimes. <laughs> you can go and just say flush the fragments I haven't acknowledged yet, right? And that's how you manage memory. Another way to do that is to make sure that from a QA process, you're actually testing the edge of memory on an ongoing basis. So that's part of the standard test process. Go run the box up at 100% and then keep hitting it with traffic and make sure it doesn't fall over with a wide range of use cases. So this is something that's baked into the culture of the organization. It's not just a feature, but it's actually part of the base software itself. Diddle with managing the management CPU. We talked about this earlier. Keep it a separate CPU so you don't go down in the event of an attack. Or at the very least, you can see what's going on. You can't defend what you can't see. Uh, we talked about statelessness and DDoS. Uh, this also applies to HTTP connections. When you register an IP address as being able to consume HTTP traffic, the NetScaler won't allocate memory until we get a valid request. So you can open up a, what you think is a full valid request, and we're going to sit there waiting for the get, and there's no memory allocated until we see it. Uh, you know, the uh, uneditable cookies. This is actually a feature of the app firewall where we can go take all of the cookies that are coming from the server, we can package them up, give them a checksum, and then send them out to the end user. So now, if they try to edit any of the checksum, we can detect those edits. And that when that traffic comes back, we undo that and send the full cookies to the server. So the app doesn't need to have to be modified in order to do that, but at the same time, mm. you are protecting against cookie modification. And then lastly, DNS DDoS. Uh, DNS DDoS has become much, much more frequent, uh, but the numbers, as you heard earlier, are, are astounding. Uh, as a result, some of the biggest registrars in the world are using Netscaler as part of their DNS security. Yep. We have a custom UDP stack, again, just like the custom TCP stack. So even though people like who use our DNS say, oh, we can see the binds, in nope. No, there's, this no is not release. bind and, and duct tape and glue, mm -hmm. right? Nope. So with that, any questions? Are any of these licensed features, or is it just like DNS DDoS, you can buy big boxes that specialize in that? So uh, these are all, so DNS in particular is baked in at the lowest level of license. So any NetScaler has DNS DDoS. Um, the memory pressure is part of the base. Uh, management CPU is part of the base. 
uh, statelessness is part of the base, and uneditable cookies, that's part of the app firewall, and the app firewall is part of a, a platinum license. Yeah. And the layer seven, we do even do layer seven HTTP DDoS protection, where we can actually protect against get floods, that's at a higher level. Yeah. Yeah, a wise enterprise. So uh, obviously we've glossed over a large number of security functions. Uh, you can go check our data sheet to see how it, it plays out. But if there are any more specific questions, uh, you know what, throw them over Twitter. I've been very noisy on Twitter as of so far, so you know how to reach me. Uh, say that you're looking for something in particular, we'd love to write about it.